Thank you. Sorry to no have problem. neglected that. That's fine. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Glowatsky. Uh, my laboratory uh, investigates synaptic transmission in the inner ear. And uh, there are really several synapses that are very important for coding the sound signal. One is the uh, synapse between the inner hair cells and auditory nerve fibers, as you see here in blue. And then secondly, there are pathways that are feedback pathways from the brain stem here in pink, uh, lateral uh, olivocochlear neurons. And they respond to the uh, noise environment and then modulate the synapse that sends the signal to the brain. So they're very important. And just want to point out, if you think about how in cochlear implants, uh, the stimulation of the auditory nerve fiber activates the nerve fibers, that does not include, or even, you know, the concept doesn't even think about this feedback from the brain that's very likely very important to modulate afferent activity. This is why we focus on it. And then secondly, uh, the outer hair cells have afferent synapses, which make about 10% of all auditory nerve fibers. And uh, the function of these synapses is close to unknown. And uh, the, um, we, we try, we are the first laboratory worldwide who was able to look at activity in these fibers. And so we're uh, studying possible functions, which I will talk about in another slide. And then the fourth topic in the lab is really to work on regeneration and repair of synapses because after noise exposure, you lose these synapses at the inner hair cells and that causes uh, deafness or, or just uh, elevated thresholds. And so we are involved with the laboratories that try to figure out how to re regenerate such synapses. And as we are physiologists, our aim is to uh, figure out functional tests that will allow people to test if the regenerated synapses work, and then uh, they can apply different substances that may make regeneration better, and we can then test them, is that a real synapse? So, uh, here are some methods in the lab. So we excise the cochlea, as you see here, and then we can do recordings from individual uh, nerve fibers in the live tissue. So we can actually look at the activity of individual uh, auditory nerve fiber synapses. And then down here, you can see uh, an imaging, um, a, a picture of an ima live imaging experiment, live meaning the tissue is alive, is uh, excised like this. But here in green, you can see auditory nerve fibers that have GCAMP, which is a calcium sensor. So in this way, we can report the activity of the auditory nerve fibers and we can uh, you know, modulate all kinds of things. For example, we can use optogenetic stimulation of the hair cells and then we can look uh, uh, how auditory nerve fiber activity changes. Uh, here on the right uh, is an experiment where we record from a plant, uh, in culture planted a neuron that has made a new connection with this green uh, string of pearls here, which are all inner hair cells. So here where the star is, you see a regenerated synapsis and we can record its activity while we stimulate the uh, hair cells with optogenetic uh, light stimulation. So, um, Thirdly, I want to show you some of these type 2 fibers that are so mysterious uh, in the organ of Corti. And the laboratory has developed a method down here, which we uh, call the half shell preparation, where we just open the organ of Corti and we can actually look at individual fibers here on the right um, that have a, a calcium sensor in them. And then we can basically look at the activity of those fibers. So uh, they're so interesting because they're very insensitive. They respond to ATP. They have properties like pain fibers and they are connected to inflammatory processes. So we try to understand how they connect uh, to uh, inflammation. And this is uh, it. So the laboratory uh, has right now uh, four postdocs. Uh, were funded by several NIDCD grants and also by the uh, Rubenstein uh, 
project and uh, here's my email if you want to contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Zandi, you are up next. Thanks, Stefan. Um, I'm Zandi Hillel. Um, I'm a laryngologist and I also run a um, airway fibrosis lab that investigates um, the immune system, epithelium, uh, and bacteria, and how they all sort of interface to cause scar in the larynx and the trachea. And then we also um, are using bioengineering strategies. We've developed a drug-eluting stent that um, we can place in mice to test different um, uh, treatments to try and uh, reverse or at least mitigate development of that scar. Next slide. Um, some of the questions we're asking, um, there's a, a few different uh, etiologies of this. And one is an extremely homogenous um, patient population. And in, in that group, we've collected about, uh, we've, we've collected DNA in about 60 individuals. And we're, we're looking at both um, genetics and transcriptomics. Um, we've started, you know, based on, based on the results in, in the transcriptomics and the genetics, we, we've started to focus in on the epithelium because a lot of the mutations seem to be localized in the epithelial cells. Um, and what we're looking at is the interaction between the, the abnormal epithelium and how it seems to initiate what is a CD4 or IL-17 uh, mediated inflammation that drives scar formation. And then at a patient safety level, um, we are looking at how we can improve patient safety um, by preventing hospital acquired airway scar, which is uh, primarily because the endotracheal tubes that are placed in intubated patients in the ICUs are, are really too big uh, for patient anatomy or are left in too long. Um, some of the methods um, and, and approaches we're taking, we are beginning a clinical trial uh, where we're going to give adjuvant therapy after surgical therapy for six weeks. And um, that is uh, uh, thanks to Johan Lina's work. Um, uh, we're we're going to start a pilot trial uh, in about 10 to 20 patients uh, with the goal of uh, hopefully leading to uh, NIH funding for a, a larger interventional trial at multiple sites. We have a mouse model, which is what the picture you can see here, um, how we uh, create scar at, on the trachea. And then we have uh, miniaturized a drug-eluting stent to place it in mice. Uh, as a strategy to, again, treat scar tissue. And then we have multiple in vitro models using human tissue. Um, next slide. So I think if you uh, joined our lab, there would be active mentorship. Uh, you can ask uh, Ruth, Johan, and Kevin, who's now on faculty here, uh, mentored multiple medical students and a few undergraduates. There would be uh, productivity at both the manuscript and grant level, and then um, uh, autonomy as well. So with that, I will um, open it up for any questions. All right, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I am, uh, just send me an email. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, connecting with you. Thank you, Zandi. Uh, Niall? Is Niall there? I thought I saw a Niall come in. All right, maybe he'll be here later. Niall, Niall, one more call. Okay. Okay. Um, I will present my stuff. 
Um, so I just want to uh, start by thanking all of you for making this quite painless for me, being super responsive. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Amanda for making this, um, for guiding me through this. She was extremely uh, helpful. And since this is the, my first time doing this, so thank you, Amanda. Um, so my lab uh, focuses on uh, type two immunity at mucosal surfaces. Um, we are particularly interested in how uh, innate immune determinant drive the development of the allergic response. Um, what we study is how uh, in susceptible individual, you have a barren sensing of really innocuous environmental proteins that we call allergens. And in those individuals, that leads to the secretion of a variety of innate cytokines like IL-25, IL-33, NTSLP, and that sets the stage for downstream uh, um, type two inflammation. And in particular, we are interested in the role of local um, activation of complement and how that drives type two responses. And we also have another interest where we try to figure out novel uh, interaction between environmental proteins and how they are recognized by different pattern recognition receptors on epithelial cells and how these, this interaction can be a, either a protective response and prevent the development of allergy or promote the development of allergy. And we use a variety of approaches. We use extensive mouse model of allergic inflammation in the respiratory tract. We use high parameter flow cytometry. We do cell sorting, ELISA and light cheek microscopy. And we do all that. And um, yeah, so that's my lab. Thank you very much. All right. Niall, if you're there, just let me know. Yep, sorry, I, I am here. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry, somehow my internet went down right when Zandy was finishing his talk. All right, well, pleasure. So I had to run to a different area to try to get the uh, internet to work. Thanks for coming back to me, appreciate it. No problem. Um, so uh, my name is Niall. Uh, I am a skull base surgeon interested in uh, sinonasal and skull base tumors. Uh, the, uh, I like to use the uh, images depicted on the first slide just to uh, show the relationship of the sinonasal cavity and how close it is to critical uh, neurovascular structures. And it's a very interesting anatomic location in that there is a wide variety of uh, different types of sinonasal malignancies that arise in such a small anatomic location. Um, so my, uh, my research interest is trying to further understand these rare tumors better. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So these are the three main research goals, and then I'll talk about um, specific projects in particular on the next slide. Uh, but the three main aims of uh, the, my research program is first, we're trying to identify what mutations are driving the, the, um, the generation of sinonasal and skull-based tumors. Uh, and we're doing that by trying to make these tumors arise in mice um, and using different approaches to try to, uh, mutational approaches to try to uh, generate these tumors um, in autochthonous murine models. Uh, the second aim is uh, trying to model uh, the tumor microenvironment of, of uh, human cyanonasal and skull-based malignancies using an immunotherapeutic approach, um, as well as uh, clinical trials that we're working on. And the last one is looking at chromatin regulatory mechanisms underlying tumor genesis. We can go to the last slide, please. Um, so in particular, my, the way my, um, uh, I'm based in Bethesda, but have uh, research uh, interest going on in Baltimore, as well as a research lab at the National Institutes of Health. Um, so it, the part that we're working on in Baltimore at the moment is uh, the, the major focus is trying to understand the role of the human papillomavirus and cyanonasal malignancies. <clears throat> and we're taking a couple different approaches to try to understand whether HPV is actually driving these tumors or whether it's just, uh, just associated in a bystander. Um, so first is we're taking a genomics approach using paraffin embedded tissue uh, obtained from our pathology colleagues and uh, performing different sequencing studies to try to understand whether there are common uh, patterns in the mutation uh, profiles in uh, HPV related sinonasal tumors and comparing these to HPV uh, tumors of the oropharynx and, and the cervix, for example. Um, the second one is an epidemiologic trial that we're currently doing that's funded by Merck 
uh, where we are enrolling patients and assessing the uh, serological response to HPV, as well as assessing behavioral risk patterns in patients who uh, have HPV positive synonasal tumors and comparing these to, uh, to our controls. Uh, and then one of the last focuses in uh, Baltimore is looking at changes in chromatin regulatory structure uh, via CHIP-seq uh, approaches, uh, particular for uh, several tumors, including uh, stesia neuroblastoma and SMARC-B1 deficient carcinoma. Uh, and then at the NIH, the projects that we're working on are more of the animal-related projects. Uh, I alluded to the autochthonous mirroring models that we're trying to develop. We're using a couple different approaches in, uh, in CRISPR, in vivo CRISPR screens, uh, as well as um, uh, other approaches to make these tumors develop, and we've had some exciting results recently. Um, we also have additional translational studies as well as uh, unique clinical trials that we're able to do at the NIH uh, for esthesia neuroblastoma, for example, um, and able to bring patients from around the country uh, to the NIH for these trials. Uh, and uh, happy to, uh, I think my email was on the first slide, and happy to uh, you know, answer any questions or discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you, Niall. Murray. Are you here, Murray? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. 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 I'm Murray Ramanathan. I'm a rhinologist and also basic scientist. Um, so the uh, focus of my lab is to really look at the role of air pollution and chronic rhinosinusitis. So we look at both um, this concept from a basic science perspective, as well as an epidemiological perspective. Um, so from a molecular perspective, we're looking at the immunologic mechanisms of how air pollution and specifically particulate matter causes CRS. We collaborate with the Bloomberg School of Public Health. My lab um, is shared with Andy Lanes, actually. So we've got three specific models that we're looking at. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one is an innovative model, like a mouse model of air pollution induced uh, chronic rhinosinusitis. We take cyanonasal epithelial cells from patients with CRS. And lastly, we uh, leverage data from EPIC and CCDA by purchasing data basically from Hopkins um, to take a look at epidemiological studies and exposure models of, of patients that have been diagnosed with rhinologic disease and what the exposures were leading up to that diagnosis. We're also looking at drug targetable um, or a protein, specifically the role of NRF2, which we've shown um, may have therapeutic value for CRS, as well as air pollution induced CRS. Next slide. So what can residents expect to learn? Um, it depends on the basic science or population-based studies, but really mouse models like immunologic assays specifically of how to measure you know, cytokine release and epithelial barrier function, cutting edge genomic assays, including single cell RNA-seq and whole genome bisulfide sequencing to look for epigenomics. And from the population side, um, really effective design of case control studies or population-based studies Recently, we just completed a study of 6,000 patients seen at Hopkins um, to look at the role of air pollution in causing CRS. And lastly, uh, residents can look forward to mentorship, um, just to publications, national talks. Um, a lot of our previous residents that are now faculty, um, either here or other places, I certainly have had great experiences. Um, so certainly feel free to reach out to me. My email is here. Um, and I'm also around, so thank you. Thanks, Murray. Next up, we have Paul. Okay, thanks everybody. So uh, somewhat like Elizabeth Kowalski was telling you, uh, I've long been interested in synaptic structure and function in the cochlea. And so uh, one of the topics that we work on involves those efferent neurons that Elizabeth mentioned. And this uh, slide kind of gives you the overall picture of what those efferent neurons are all about. Uh, the sound that is processed within the cochlea enters the central nervous system. And among other things it does, it activates these efferent neurons, which themselves are inhibitory in the cochlea. So they make inhibitory synapses on um, cochlear hair cells and suppress the sensitivity of the cochlea. 
And uh, they release a set of coding to do that. So in the next slide, what this has enabled us to do is to work with partners in Argentina who clone the, the genes that code for the hair cells acetylcholine receptors and thereby generate genetic models of mice to ask what, what these efferents are all about, what do they do? And one of the things that we're quite interested in is the fact that it's known from a variety of studies that this efferent feedback process reduces the sensitivity of the cochlea probably in a lot of interesting ways for signals analysis, but also it can uh, reduce the impact of acoustic trauma. So it's protective. And we show that here in these um, uh, mouse experiments where the animals were exposed to a, a loud sound that produced a temporary threshold shift. So you can see that in the um, wild type column, the leftmost one, where the threshold to sound measured by the acoustic brain, uh, auditory brainstem response, uh, one day after acoustic trauma was elevated by 20 dB or better and then seven days later recovered back to baseline. So it was a temporary threshold shift. In mice that had the acetylcholine receptor that's activated by the efferents, when that receptor was knocked out, that's the middle column, you see that the, temporary, that the threshold shift after acoustic trauma was larger uh, and then failed to recover. So they had more trouble after this acoustic trauma. And then best of all, there's a, a mouse in which there's a point mutation that produces a gain of function change in the hair cells acetylcholine receptor. So these animals have stronger than normal efferent feedback. And what you can see in these animals in the rightmost column is that that same acoustic trauma protocol basically caused no hearing loss at all. So we look on this as a possibility for a sort of um, therapeutic intervention. Maybe we can use the efferent feedback as a way of protecting hearing and those uh, patients which are particularly susceptible, perhaps by genetics or family history. So in the next slide, what we're doing is using a viral transduction uh, tool to try to rescue acetylcholine receptor knockout mice by causing expression of that gain of function receptor. And so this virus uh, is injected into the inner ear by way of a small insertion into the posterior semicircular canal. And then we can look to see how those animals do when they are exposed to acoustic trauma. So on the right-hand side of this slide, we see that so far things are looking pretty good. Um, the uh, black and cyan colored blobs are showing you how much hearing loss, or what threshold shift occurred in both the wild type or the uninjected knockout animals in black or animals that were knockouts but injected with a virus that contained not the acetylcholine receptor, but a green fluorescent protein. So that should not produce the benefit. And you can see that those animals had similar kinds of threshold shifts after acoustic trauma. But in magenta are the mice that received a viral injection that contained the alpha-9, the acetylcholine receptor that we're interested in. And you can see there that there was a significantly smaller shift in threshold uh, in those animals having been exposed to, exposed to acoustic trauma. So this is just step one of a long process whereby we hope to continue to improve on this, but it's a good proof of principle and we're pretty excited about what the opportunities lie ahead for this kind of strategy. So I'm happy to take uh, questions by email if you wanna learn more about our projects and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Next we have uh, Nick, Nick Rowan. Thanks everyone. I come to this every year just to remind myself of how stinking smart you all are. Um, it's really awesome. So kudos to uh, my co-faculty here. Uh, my name is Nick Rowan, everybody. I'm one of the only non-real uh, scientists that's presenting tonight with a basic science lab. And uh, I'm a sinus and endoscopic skull base surgeon. Stefan, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I kind of look at three general broad research aims uh, in my research efforts, and um, first being smell and taste. So um, back as a, a resident and a fellow, we started looking at patients who had more or less stuffy noses, patients who have chronic sinusitis, and you know they have kind of immediate implications on whether they can smell, sometimes whether they can taste, and that interest has really kind of developed into my main research interest over the past few years, especially in the setting that, um, you know, some of my research interests have been kind of limited secondary to stuck, sticking stuff up people's noses in the current pandemic. And so um, what we've been looking at is actually the use of the sense of smell 
as a predictor of things like frailty, as a, a predictor of mortality, as a predictor of weight, and how patients are going to do after uh, surgeries and or interventions. It's a really kind of unique screening measure. We've done this from a population level, so big data, um, and also in kind of prospective trials. We're just, we just wrapped up a trial with the University of Pennsylvania where everybody who had had a neck cancer and was going to get a surgery, um, I got a brief smell test ahead of their surgery to kind of see how they did afterwards. And so lots of clinical projects here with regard to smell and taste. There's many kind of untapped populations um, in which I've got ideas uh, to look into in the future. I'm also an endoscopic skull base surgeon, meaning that I do, um, I take out some tumors through the nose. I work with neurosurgery to take tumors out through the nose. It's really cool, really innovative, um, a kind of minimally invasive corridor, but there's lots of problems that these patients have afterwards. Sometimes we introduce scarring to the nose. Um, sometimes we actually uh, cause them to have smell and taste problems afterwards. And so we have a couple of ongoing multi-institutional trials. First, we use a protective sheath in the nose to kind of prevent scarring. We are looking at ways to improve patients' sense of smell and potentially their sense of taste or their perception of flavor afterwards. And um, furthermore, we have a few ongoing uh, clinical outcomes uh, projects in patients who are undergoing endoscopic sinus surgery. Next slide, please. The left side are kind of projects that I'm leaning uh, more, so, more so away from, but certainly I'm happy to have discussions about case, report, case reports, retrospective reviews, and some broader kind of systematic reviews, meta-analyses type things that are good for students. Um, but I've been focusing more recently on the right-handed studies, so population, big data studies. I'm familiar with the statistics and happy to kind of instruct med students and residents on how to do this. And sometimes these projects are a little more achievable when uh, you don't have time that you can sit in a lab or you have, a busy, you have busy coursework, busy rotation, something along those lines. Um, there's a lot of availability and opportunity for ongoing prospective trials. We have, uh, um, again, some ongoing projects with the multidisciplinary teams from different institutions where we're looking at things like how patients do after surgeries and the different types of surgeries that I do and how they smell and taste afterwards. And uh, happy to have meetings with anybody, happy to have a talk, uh, hopefully pretty approachable guy. My email is down below. And uh, thanks for coming tonight, everybody. Thanks for presenting all. Thank you, Nick. All right. Next up, we have Amanda Lauer. Thank you. So uh, while we're setting up, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, so I'm Amanda and I have uh, primarily a basic science slash preclinical lab um, and we mostly look at hearing loss and sometimes we delve into vestibular uh, end organs, I'll say. Um, primarily we use anatomical, um, behavioral, and um, evoke potential measurements to characterize structure function relationships um, in models of hearing loss using mice, sometimes bats, sometimes interesting creatures like mole rats. Um, and we're interested in um, the interface between the ear and the brainstem, both afferent and efferent. Um, but what I would like to talk to you about today is something that's newer for my lab, which is some human temporal bone research. So we've for a long time been doing um, sort of temporal bone research in our mouse models. Um, but it turns out that uh, we have, uh, next slide please, a very, very large human temporal bone collection at Johns Hopkins that has mostly been collecting dust for many years. So uh, this is just showing um, part of the collection here. Um, you can see these cabinets are all filled with boxes of human temporal bones that were collected uh, by Samuel Crow and Stacy Guild in the 1920s and 30s up until World War II. And turns out there are probably about 1800 individuals, I mean, individual people where we have specimens for them through the, the um, sections through the ears. And we have detailed audiometric um, data from them. Sometimes we have some vestibular testing and a lot of medical histories. And what's really special about this collection is that, uh, well, a couple of things. One is that the audiograms were measured using, um, you see that giant audiometer uh, in, in the bottom uh, left panel. Uh, that was wheeled around the hospital and patients were tested basically within days of, um, of uh, when, when they were deceased. And um, uh, they did a lot of very 
detailed analysis of the ear. At the time, they were really just trying to figure out what part of the cochlea responded to high frequencies. And so they started looking um, at patients that had what they called high tone deafness, high frequency hearing loss. Uh, they had it completely backwards. They thought that the apex responded to high frequencies um, and the base responded to low, uh, but quickly realized their error. But in doing this work, they, they actually noticed some really important things that are even now still sort of under study and under debate um, about patterns of loss in the ear and how those match up or don't match up to hearing loss patterns. Um, for instance, loss of auditory nerve fibers when elder hair cells are still alive. Um, so uh, the second thing that's very um, unique about this large collection is that about 40% of the specimens were from African-American individuals. And uh, we think, well, we're almost 100% positive this is the most diverse specimen collection in the United States, possibly in the world. And so the plan is to um, dig this thing out of the dust and get all of these specimens digitized and start doing some sort of big data studies on them. We've been doing here and there some smaller studies, but uh, we have a really special opportunity here. Um, and we have an additional two to 300 specimens that were collected post-World War II. Um, so uh, there are some interesting comparisons just in um, the, the medical history of the patients. A lot of infectious diseases happened in the patients from 20s and 30s and less so after World War II and um, the widespread use of antibiotics. And also in Baltimore, a lot of the patients um, post-World War II were working in factories, noisy factories, um, which could contribute to uh, the audiometric phenotype and the status of the ear. So we are actually preparing a large grant to support some of the work on this, to um, digitize and curate the collection so that it's widely available to the community, um, the research community. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for residents and med students and undergrads to get involved in this. And, um, the plan is also to start collecting more specimens by um, linking up with the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, possibly the Alzheimer's BioCard study, and maybe even other studies as well. So next slide, please. I just want to give you an example of the kinds of things that we can do. So this work and really most of the human temporal bone work in the lab has been done by Nick Anderson, who is one of the current T32 residents. Um, and I'll just volunteer Nick right now. Um, to answer your questions about the experience of working with the human temporal bones. Um, he's been a good sport. Like we've gone to, you know, dusty warehouses and all sorts of interesting places to try to find the history of this collection um, so that we really understand what we have. And uh, so here we're just showing um, uh, data from a paper where um, we characterize pigmentation in human and animal um, model ears uh, with age. And we actually um, did this as a bit of a follow-up on some early study, earlier studies that showed that there's increased pigmentation in the stria vascularis and then the vis vestibular epithelium of uh, um, African-American individuals. And this is thought to be protective against hearing and uh, vestibular dysfunctional, which has been documented at a population level. Uh, so we analyzed this pigmentation. We did it also in our, our mice, which I don't show the data here, um, and we looked at stria vascularis size um, and showed um, increase in pigmentation with age, but already even in pediatric specimens, African-Americans have more pigmentation um, in, in the ear. And uh, now we're looking at how this correlates with things like outer hair cell and spiral ganglion um, survival so that we can get some idea of the mechan possible mechanism um, to, tar to, to know if, if these, um, this pigmentation is really um, aiding prevention of, of dysfunction with age. Uh, one thing it might be doing is helping um, to scavenge free radicals, but we really don't have good data. We don't have a great animal model for this at the moment. So we're trying to learn more from the humans so that we can develop an animal model for a mechanism. Um, and I'll just close up by saying, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of structures to look at and a lot of different interesting patients to look at. We've been collaborating quite a bit with the neurotologists in the department to look at uh, different aspects of hearing imbalance in um, different patients. And so if you have an interest, you're an interest in a certain type of disorder, um, but especially age, um, 
We'd like to hear from you. And I'm done. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. Next up is Jean King. Jean Kim. Sorry. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. I'm Jean Kim. I'm one of the rhinologists. And um, my interest, I am at Truly a molecular biologist and biochemist by training. And I uh, run a wet basic science laboratory, uh, which um, is active in investigating uh, a uh, and using a translational approach to studying my niche area of interest, which is uh, nasal polyps and the pathogenesis of nasal polyps. And so uh, one of my main focuses of research in this regard is to really understand why these polyps are recalcitrant and hyperplastic. And uh, uh, we, we know and we understand the immune system certainly drives uh, this, and it's a very complex interaction of the immune system with the epithelial cells. So we're actually interested in the structural um, uh, aspects of the epithelial cell that are contributing to this hyperplastic behavior. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, throughout that work, what we've been able to do is actually embarked upon, you know, of course, sporadically, which is how science happens, uh, to identify the natural ligand for the death cell receptor that's specific to eosinophils. And, and the eosinophils, as you all know, is the is the um, poster child for the type two uh, inflammatory uh, uh, cell type that is involved in this disease and perpetuating the inflammation in this disease. So um, anyway, that was done in collaboration with my colleagues in pharmacology, uh, my postdoc uh, that's shared between myself and pharmacology and uh, Ginny Drake. And, um, and so, you know, we've been able to really bring some of the studies uh, from what we do as clinicians and collecting this, this uh, tissue, interrogating it into the lab, and hopefully identifying biomarkers that can be useful as potential drug targets. So, so that's, that's my uh, pet peeve um, interest, um, research interest. And the second question that uh, we've really kind of grown to in my lab and trying to understand is the mucosal biology of how the auto, uh, autoimmunity affects sinus disease. Um, because as you all know, it's a very complex uh, situation. And, um, and we're very fortunate this year, we've just embarked upon obtaining a major NIH funded grant where we're really gonna interrogate this on a cell to cell level with um, single cell RNA-seq and a um, bunch of high-tech um, uh, uh, approaches, including the more um, usual molecular approaches. And next slide, please. Um, and these would include things that go on in our lab, you know, typical immunoblots, real-time PCR flow, cytometry, uh, all sorts of microscopy. And we do this in human cells, in human tissue exclusively, um, laser capture microdissection. And uh, we hope to, with the, with the uh, more higher tech uh, technology, uh, really incorporate that into a large data microarray and um, uh, le level analysis on both uh, gene expression as well as proteins. And so um, we, in the lab, you would be working with our our uh, postdoc. Um, we also have a pre-doctoral candidate um, that uh, in pharmacology that is uh, working with us, as well as an MD PhD student from Hopkins, um, Austin Maddox, which I'm, uh, I think you probably met uh, when he was on his uh, third year rotation. And so we have multiple collaborations on both campuses, both at, uh, at the Woods Bakes Basic Science, where um, uh, our, our, um, our people in our lab are, are spending time as well as the CRB2 um, with uh, some of our collaborators and our projects on the molecular mechanisms of hyperplastic uh, cell behavior um, of epithelial cells and, and of course the, the Asthma and Allergy Center where we're uh, uh, you know, smack dab in the middle of our pulmonology and allergy and immunology colleagues. So, um, so anyway, uh, the um, uh, people that have gone through are Ginny, who I've mentioned, and she recently won the uh, ARS Basic Science Research Award. 
um, for this her presentation and uh, and in fact this cosm will be uh, Austin will be presenting at the plenary session um, and uh, my postdoc is also presenting at the Quad AI which is the premier allergy and immunology society here uh, in the United States so um, there is uh, multiple opportunities and, and we expect you to be presenting as well as um, as uh, writing these uh, abstracts up for publication. Um, so um, next slide, please. So, um, so in terms of a resident and medical school learning objective, it, it's really to understand the translational approach, how to bring bedside observations to bench, to interrogate them from a mechanistic level and then the goal being ultimately to bring it back to the bedside in terms of therapeutics. Um, uh, the opportunity to really have both in internal and external coursework. It's very important for scientific development. You don't work in a vacuum. You don't work even in a single institution. It's very important to collaborate and, um, and uh, hopefully to um, learn something about clinical study design and execution as, uh, as we are embarking upon our new project with the mucosal biology. Uh, much, much of this will be uh, integrated into some of our clinical trial studies that are ongoing. And uh, of course, scientific writing, your expectations are to present at these, our national meetings and uh, also to uh, produce the currency for which, uh, for your, which you do your work, which is publications. So um, here's my email. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> And next up, we have Raj. All right, thanks, Stefan. There we go. Yeah, so my name's Raj Mandel. Um, I, my lab is actually embedded in Drew Pardol's larger lab, who's the uh, director of the Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. Our group really focuses on head and neck cancer immunotherapy, really trying to understand the immunological and genomic determinants of response and resistance um, to cancer immunotherapy in head and neck tumors. Um, so go to the next slide. And so as a group, we really try, um, sorry, can you run through the animations there? Oh yes, Sean. Yeah, sorry, I think I messed up. Yeah, and so as a group, we really try to leverage um, our strengths. And as a group of surgeons, we have access to human samples. And that's really where you'll come in as a translational researcher uh, many of you might recognize this young disheveled individual. Um, his name is Dr. Chris Maroon. He's a famous ENT resident now, but before then he had his humble beginnings in the lab. And Chris was really instrumental in going into the laboratory, collecting tumor samples from our cases, taking them to the laboratory where he would do the dissociation and um, submit this for uh, sequencing, essentially do the processing and take it through the entire workflow. And uh, every minute really counts during this process. Um, and I think that's kind of the strength of our laboratory is kind of bridging this gap between the lab and um, the clinic. And you can go to the next slide there. Oh, and we can do another number of downstream analyses. And in terms of what we're doing in the laboratory, there's a number of techniques we're doing, but in a nutshell, what it entails is taking treatment, pre-treatment biopsy samples from the clinic, whether it be blood or tumor. And then we wait four weeks as we give anti-PD-1 on a clinical trial to the patient. And then we'll collect blood and tumor again at the post-therapy resection in the operating room. And so you'll take those samples from the operating room, you'll shuttle them back to the laboratory and you'll do a number of really exciting analyses, including single cell RNA sequencing, um, flow cytometry, whole exome sequencing, and we're really trying to uncover what is happening. We are going from the pre-therapy sample to the post-therapy sample in terms of targetable receptors that we are upregulated in adaptive fashion. And the whole idea is that if we can identify what's happening when you go from pre to post-therapy, we can create rationale for new drugs, new therapeutics to deliver as a new clinical trial. Um, the next slide there. And in parallel, we have a number of functional models as well. This is through organoids as well as histoculture models. Basically, we'll take tumor samples, 
will grow them in the lab, essentially a 3D reconstruction of a tumor in the, in the laboratory and where we can test some of these agents um, in parallel to the patient who's receiving anti-PD-1. And that really gives us some more mechanistic insights into what's happening when you go from pre to post therapy. And we can test a number of drugs that we're not able to test in the human yet, but show some rationale in a functional model about what might be happening when you go from pre to post therapy. And um, finding some interesting results that are emerging from all this. And we're um, putting together the paper for the first piece of this, which is just the clinical trial piece. Um, and then we're moving on to some of the organoid development as well. In addition to a number of other clinical trials that we're looking at anti-myeloid agents as well. So I think it's a really exciting time for the lab. Love for you guys to all be part of that. Um, next slide here, the last slide. Yeah, and so this is just a little bit of some examples of the organoids that were being grown in the laboratory. And then we keep going to the next. And you can see that we do the flow cytometry as well as single cell sequencing, single cell RNA sequencing on those models. And then next slide. And here are some examples of the organoids that we've generated in the lab. And you can see the tumor infiltrating sites and the organoids grown in culture. I think we're going to the last slides. Yep. And then and then we can move on to the next slide, actually. Some of these got cut. Okay, great. And so that really is kind of the, the lab in a nutshell. We'd love for you guys to come by, stop by the lab, see what we're doing. Uh, ask Chris or any bales that's been through the lab and um, love to hear from you guys and let me know if you have any questions. Rash, really, I, I have a question for you. Sure. I, I was wondering how common is it to use patient cells or tumor cells from patient and grow organoids and screen a variety of, of uh, drugs to see what they could respond to? Is that something that's commonly done or is no, it, is it not, not at all. Cool? It's, okay. Yeah, not at all. So it's kind of cutting edge. Um, few groups are doing it across the, across the world, but um, we're just starting and, you know, I won't lie, it's technically challenging, but that's what makes it exciting. And um, uh, we're, we're just kind of starting to scratch the surface. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, next up is Brian Ward. Uh, Brian, let me know when you want me to uh, start your videos. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm Brian Ward. I am. Uh, I study how MRIs, one of the things, how MRIs cause dizziness uh, and vertigo. Um, that's kind of something I've been working on since I was a resident here um, for about the last 10 years. Um, you can advance through the videos and just kind of play them. So this is um, an example of eye movements in an MRI machine. So this, I think Nick and, and Danielle and some of the others on here um, have all been um, kind enough to be studies in these research experiments where their eyes kind of beat back and forth and they feel like they're spinning. Um, so you can just kind of continue to advance. Um, you're going to see what happens to a zebrafish when it spins inside an MRI machine um, and, uh, and they kind of flip and twist and turn and it's really cool and interesting. Um, keep going, advancing and mice. Um, so we um, currently aren't doing any zebrafish or mouse experiments, but we'll continue to do some with um, chinchillas and guinea pigs um, and uh, advanced. <clears throat> and through these experiments, we've figured out sort of the mechanism for how MRI machines uh, stimulate the inner ear. Um, and it's an interaction between the normal ion currents that are going into your vestibular hair cells and the strong magnetic field. And it causes this push on the, um, the cupola. Uh, causing dizziness and vertigo symptoms. And so um, we are continuing to use this as a tool to stimulate the vestibular system and study how the brain adapts to a constant acceleration stimulus. Um, we are uh, also continuing to experiment in patients, for instance, with Meniere's disease um, and in healthy controls. Uh, next slide. But um, what I'm increasingly interested in is using MRIs for their actual purpose, which is to image the inner ear. <laughs> um, uh, and so there are a bunch of dis diagnoses, for instance, one here, which is vestibular atelectasis, and you can continue to advance, um, and, uh, and others where we know about them or hypothesize about them based on eye movements or from histopathology, but 
we can't see them in life because our imaging technology is not good enough. Um, I tell patients and others that I am uh, envious all the time of my colleagues in ophthalmology who can just dilate the eye and look at the back and see the blood vessels and see the nerves directly. Um, and we have nothing like that for the inner ear and it makes me very sad. And so hopefully one day um, we will be able to see with that kind of resolution um, <laughs> The, uh, the blood vessels of the ear and the, and the sensory structures of the ear. Um, what you see on the upper right is an example of a really high resolution MRI of the cochlea, um, where you can um, see all these, these beautiful sensory structures in, in really histopathology uh, level resolution. Um, we're not quite there, um, but, um, but what I am doing is clinical studies in seven Tesla and three Tesla with fancy new technology um, to try to image better um, patients and healthy controls. And next slide. And, um, and sort of complementary to that has been um, sort of working with um, Dr. Lauer in reinvigorating our temporal bone histopathology here. Um, so we just did a study in patients with Meniere's disease where we found that, um, that uh, patients often have this swelling of the saccule or utricle that actually compresses or presses on the lateral semicircular canal. And this is accounting for uh, the decreased caloric responses in patients with Meniere's disease. Um, and so we're excited by the, the possibility of um, using histopathology um, and sort of modern research methods that are available here at Hopkins to, uh, to sort of reinvigorate our collection and, and hopefully to start collecting new specimens. So there's lots of opportunities for um, imaging and in histopathology um, if any of the residents or students who uh, are interested. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian. Hey, Stefan, can I just share my screen? It'll probably work better. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna suggest that yeah. for your presentation here. I'll yeah. stop mine and you can just jump in. Great. Yeah. Um, all right, is that, uh, is that is that showing up? Yeah. Great, all right, so uh, I'm Pete Creighton. Uh, I'm one of the ear and skull-based surgeons um, here. Uh, I work uh, primarily out of the uh, Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics out of the uh, Whitting School of Engineering. Um, and kind of big picture is uh, we're trying to develop uh, kind of semi-autonomous methods for skull-based surgery um, using uh, computer vision, robotics, and uh, some deep learning. So uh, big picture is that uh, medicine as a whole has done a pretty good job of bringing uh, robotics to surgery. Uh, they've done a pretty good job of bringing image guidance to surgery. We have not done such a good job of actually bringing image guidance to robotics. Um, and so I think one of the um, real potentials in um, uh, ear and skull base surgery, and one of the reasons it really hasn't uh, caught on in that area is that we really need to be able to bring uh, super high resolution image guidance uh, into robotics. Uh, and so our lab spends a lot of time using computer vision and machine learning methods to do that. Um, and what we're kind of ultimately trying to come up with is a way, I, like I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be Rob Labity and build a fully autonomous cochlear implant because um, he's, he's already done that. Um, I think what we're really trying to come up with is a method to augment uh, and improve surgical efficiency without taking the surgeon out of the operating room. Um, and so to do that, uh, we use uh, something called a cooperative control robot. Um, so this is a robot that um, the surgeon and um, robot holds an instrument in parallel. Um, and so to give you kind of an idea of that, so you can adapt whatever instrument you want into it uh, and you're able to kind of move the drill. Um, and what this allows you to do is uh, it uh, does things like reduce tremor and, and other things that for ear surgery isn't really that important. Um, but what it can do is it can allow you to work with uh, what's called virtual fixtures. So virtual fixtures is a term uh, phrase from the Air Force in the 90s, but basically it's uh, placing a virtual barrier around a structure that you can have a, a, then an impact in the real world. So what we've uh, kind of big picture for what we're doing is you know creating virtual barriers around important structures in the ear, um, registering that to our robotic workspace and then allowing people to drill like they normally would uh, but it's kind of like going bowling with the bumpers up. Uh, you can't actually throw it in the gutter. The robot will stop you from doing that. Um, and so this is just an example. This is a, a grad student who's never drilled before, uh, is drilling a mastoid. Um, and the robot basically is keeping him from going too high, too low, too forward. Um, we just told him to drill wherever he can drill. Um, and it took him about three minutes to do a pretty much a perfect mastoid. Um, so this is very basic. No one really needs a robot to do a, you know, a simple mastoidectomy. But uh, we're now expanding this into um, uh, things like trans labs and uh, oral atresia and other, uh, other indications. Um, the other side of things that we're very interested in is trying to um, uh, teach a computer vision or, or deep learning system how to actually understand what it's seen on a microscope screen. 
Um, and so one of the things that's really hard in deep learning for uh, medical and you know, uh, imaging and surgical stuff is that it's very hard to get training data. Um, so we're uh, working on a pipeline right now to use a virtual temple bone uh, simulator to not only train residents, but to also um, develop um, uh, basically uh, training data for a deep learning network. So this is, uh, this is uh, basically me drilling a mastoidectomy and, uh, uh, with a VR headset and, and three dimensions. And you can see this is pretty, pretty lifelike. We can use this lifelike image to teach a deep learning system to then be able to um, teach a stereoscopic microscope how to detect depth. So this is the left and right eye image of a microscope. And you can see here, we're able to pick up, you know, where we are in depth. So blue is deeper and, uh, and kind of fuchsia is in green or, or closer up. So using that depth map, uh, we can actually take preoperative CT scanning, and then we can um, actually use it to create uh, 3D models just solely based out of uh, microscopic images. Um, and then we can then map that onto um, 3D, um, or sorry, to preoperative CT scans uh, with the hope of basically having a method to do full-time image navigation without actually needing any external equipment, just doing it solely through teaching a microscope how to understand what it's seen. Um, and then finally, um, or I guess, sorry, I think it's the last slide. I wanted to keep it short. So um, the um, other aspect of this is also we are um, using this to determine objectively what defines someone as a good surgeon. Um, you know, we all know we can watch residents operate and say this person is good or this person is not so good and they need improvement, um, but actually trying to objectively define what we're, what we're physically seeing that actually makes that difference is hard. Um, and so Daniel Trachemus right now uh, is spending a lot of time working on that. Um, and then we've got a bunch of, pretty much if, if you want an excuse to use some engineering uh, and AI and the ear skull base, uh, we, we, we've, we've got people to do it. So um, uh, happy to answer any questions or just feel free to send me an email if you have any interest. Thank you, Pete. So next up we have uh, Wade. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, my name is Wei Chen. I'm one of the neurotologists in the department. Um, my practice is based at the National Capital Region. So I have not had the pleasure of meeting some of you, but I hope that to have the opportunity to do so in the near future. Um, so uh, I run the inner ear gene therapy at NIDCD. So over the next couple of minutes, I would like to talk to you about what we do. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, inner ear gene therapy is really in a very exciting field over the past few years. So as all of you know, hearing loss and dizziness, uh, they are very common disabilities affecting the world's population today. Unfortunately, uh, the treatment options for hearing loss and dizziness are somewhat limited. Um, for patients that have hearing loss or sensory neural hearing loss, that is, uh, treatment options include mostly hearing aids and also cochlear implants. And the treatment options for patients with vestibular dysfunction uh, are even more limited than that with most patients being referred to uh, vestibular rehab. Although with Dr. De La Santina's work on uh, vestibular implants, hopefully we'll have new uh, therapies to offer these patients in the near future. Um, but uh, over the past few years, through the efforts of, uh, from our lab and other, also other labs across the world, um, inner gene therapy has been shown to have great potential as a treatment uh, for hearing loss and dizziness. So our program at NIDCD uh, has three main areas of uh, uh, research interest. The first area in our lab is to try to optimize gene delivery into the mammalian inner ear. So we have been working on different surgical approaches um, to access the mammalian inner ear, both in mice and also more recently in non-human primates. And the idea here is that we really want to find uh, a surgical approach that can deliver uh, our genetic materials into the inner ear uh, most efficiently and also uh, 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 most uh, safely uh, to uh, have minimum effect on the uh, animals uh, or patients' uh, uh, inner ear function. Um, and uh, the second main area of research is to uh, apply uh, gene therapy to various mouse models of hearing loss and dizziness. So, and we are doing this in a variety of different ways. We're doing this uh, mostly using um, by Virus, uh, adeno associated virus uh, to be more specific. And uh, more recently, we are also starting to use um, uh, CRISPR uh, genome editing uh, to apply to some uh, mouse models of uh, hereditary hearing loss. 
And the third main area of research is to try to translate inner ear gene therapy to patients with hearing loss and dizziness. So I currently have a clinical protocol at the NIH where we're trying to study the natural history of patients with autosomal dominant uh, non-syndromic uh, hearing loss. Uh, and uh, also we are trying to uh, uh, test um, CRISPR genome editing uh, on uh, cells that cell lines that are generated from these patients. So um, with that in mind, next slide, please. So why come and work with us? Well, you know, as I mentioned before, inner ear gene therapy is a really exciting area to work. Um, there has already been one uh, clinical trial uh, that was concluded on, uh, in, in humans on inner ear gene therapy, and there are several clinical trials that are being planned. So uh, it is, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, um, the translation of inner ear gene therapy into patients is just right around the corner. So it's really an exciting area of, uh, of research to work on. And the second uh, reason is that, you know, you will have access to uh, the NIH Clinical Center, which is the world's largest hospital dedicated to clinical research. And the expertise that you will you know, get at the NIH in general, not just at the clinical center is I think unparalleled. Um, so that's another reason to think about coming to work with us. And of course, you know, if, if you're in the T32 program, for example, uh, where you'll be spending two years uh, to do research, you may even think about moving down to DC to live for, uh, for a couple of years. And uh, you know, DC uh, has a lot to offer both in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, outdoors uh, recreation and uh, restaurants and the arts and things like that. So, um, so I think it's a, you know, it's a great place to spend a couple of years. So I think those are attractive reasons to consider to come and work with us. So if you're interested, please let me know. Thanks so much for your time and for your attention. Thank you, Wade. Um, next up we have, uh, Jason Nellis. Hello. Oh, I'm glad you can make it. Yeah, <laughs> I just stepped out of surgery real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll be brief. Uh, my work isn't quite as brilliant as Dr. Chen's. Um, that's some pretty cool stuff um, with the gene therapy. Um, so just to uh, give you a little bit about, for I know there's some medical students. I'm one of the facial plastic surgeons in the department. And uh, my real focus, it really stems from the research I did as a resident, is looking at facial perception and quality of life and specifically looking on how surgery impacts facial deformity along the realms of patient and societal perceptions. Um, in other words, what is the real effect of what we're doing for our patients? Uh, next slide. So uh, just a little highlight, um, you know, every time we go out into public, our face is a sense of our identity. It displays who we are, our identity, our health, our a lot of times our personality, um, it has a big influence on mate choices, you know, friendships, even there's been studies showing it can influence even hiring decisions. And, uh, there's the study by Dion that highlighted this halo effect stereotype where, uh, improved attractiveness, which really is defined by symmetry, averageness, and sexual dimorphism has an increased perception of intelligence, health, and, uh, appearing to be more social and even more morally upright. Uh, now, there's some argument as to why this is, you know, are we hardwired for symmetry? Uh, does it provide us evolutionary advantage? Uh, could it be that asymmetry or deformity is sort of a marker of disease? Um, so has this led to a perceptual bias that's sort of ingrained on how we perceive faces? Uh, next slide. So with that little background in mind, um, really most of the research I'm doing is uh, sort of patient reported outcomes, so more specifically, really try, trying to understand, you know, what influences the way we perceive faces? How does that change with surgery? And that can range everything from, you know, facial deformity from either head neck cancer, uh, could also be, uh, you know, skin cancer requiring reconstructions as well as facial paralysis. But even on aesthetic surgery too, you know, um, sort of understanding the motivations and expectations of patients undergoing aesthetic facial surgery and how does that change not only the way they feel about themselves, but how did that, how does that impact when they go out in society, you know, go to the grocery store. Um, now more related to facial deformity. Uh, some of the study I did was looking at like depression, anxiety, and how facial deformity, especially facial paralysis uh, affects that. Um, and, you know, one thing we find is with surgery, you know, technically you can make things more symmetric and more functional, 
Uh, but oftentimes there's a psychological and even a social component that isn't specifically addressed by the surgery. And so I was looking at alternative supplements that we can add to our surgical therapy. And something that I found pretty interesting is uh, mindfulness meditation as a means of, you know, treating patients who have a high risk of depression or anxiety in these facial reconstruction patients. And uh, that's sort of what I'm working on right now is designing a trial to uh, implement this and seeing, you know, how does this affect patient satisfaction, psychosocial health? How does it help restore their sense of identity? So as to complement what we're doing with surgery, um, a little bit of background on that is they've already did some studies uh, where uh, using practices like either mindfulness meditation or yoga or Tai Chi, um, they found that it does uh, address depression and anxiety, sort of when, especially when controlling all of the factors. So uh, that may be something that um, may be a big uh, influence. The other thing that'd be interesting is also looking at aesthetic patients and how does that affect patient satisfaction? And so a lot of what we do in facial plastic surgery isn't just the anatomic changes that we're doing with surgery, but also, you know, your discussions with the patients preoperatively, postoperatively. And I'm really interested in trying to understand that better just so we can help patients. Uh, and the last leg is looking at innovation and implementation of technology and improving objective outcomes in our field. Um, so in that specifically, you know, a lot of times you'll find in the literature that there's multiple ways to skin a cat in terms of getting the same outcome. And I've, I'm interested in trying to compare these different techniques and seeing, well, is there one that is better? Um, and there's different means of doing that. And then finally, trying to, you know, develop different ways of, uh, you know, for instance, flat monitoring is something that I've been thinking about more recently in terms of using like thermal imaging to help with flat design as well as monitoring postoperatively as well as designing a ear reconstructive des, uh, device. And so if, if that's something that sounds interesting to you, really excited to um, collaborate and uh, sort of hear your thoughts. And I think sort of the world is our oyster. We have a lot of resources here at Hopkins and a lot of uh, really smart people to collaborate with. And so I think, uh, I think it'd be fun to do. So yeah, if you have any questions, uh, you know, you can feel free to uh, I think you should have my email, but shoot me an email while it's fine, time to meet. And, um, uh, you know, the goals being not only just do some cool research, but hopefully give you a skill set where, one, you can understand uh, biostatistics and study design. And that way, you know, in the future, when you're off on your own, you can uh, do some high quality research in some interesting fields. Um, all right, uh, next slide. I think, I think that's all. Yes, no question. Okay. All right, thank All right. you, Jason. Thanks. All right, bye. Next, we have uh, Pete Mossler. Hi, Pete. Hi, Stefan. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm one of the head and neck cancer and reconstructive surgeons here. Uh, my focus of research is the use of opioids in head and neck procedures. Next slide, please. I'm sorry for the uh, animation. So oh. we don't know about the opioid e epidemic and the, the big problem here is that uh, out of the 10.1 million people who are misusing opioids, 9.7 are using pre uh, prescription pain medication. And this is mainly a problem of diversion where the pills that are given for uh, prescription are distributed out and used for an unintended purpose. And next slide. Um, we know that uh, in our our literature that about three to 10% of opioid naive patients will start or continue to take opioids one year after surgery. And this is about one in 12 um, uh, otolaryngology patients will as well. Next slide. And if we look at our, our data, we know that 50% of prescribed uh, post-operative opioids go unused. Next slide in head and neck uh, patients, looking at parathyroid, thyroid, parotidectomy and torus patients. Next slide. So the main purpose of my research is try to reduce post-operative opioid use, but at the same time provide adequate post-operative pain control. We don't want our patients to suffer, but we don't want them to become addicted either. So um, I'm gonna determine our post-operative prescription patterns, and I also wanna devise novel strategies to reduce the opioid requirements. Next slide. And I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do this in multiple ways. So we're looking at retrospective reviews to look at our prescription patterns to elucidate um, how much we're prescribing to patients and how much they need. 
um, looking at a randomized uh, trial to evaluate the effect of uh, counseling on post-operative opi opioid consumption, seeing if just discussing this with patients can reduce their uh, expectation or improve their expectations and reduce their opioid uh, um, usage. I'm trying to look at opioid of alternatives to try to decrease um, use by looking at long acting anesthetics, NSAIDs and gabapentinoids. We're engaging in a prospective trial to evaluate um, opioid prescriptions, like basically seeing how much patients are being prescribed for each uh, procedure that they are having, how much they're uh, taking and what is their pain score on uh, seven days post-operatively and then looking how much uh, oxycodone they're taking and also how much are they leaving behind, which can increase the risk of diversion. And finally, I have a clinical trial that's opening up in April, uh, trying to pair a novel stimulus clove oil uh, with opioid and conditioning that reaction to uh, try to decrease post-operative uh, opioid use in our free flat patients. So I have a multiple um, areas of study in, in, under the umbrella of opioid research to try to decrease uh, opioid use in our patients. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Next up, we have uh, Andy Lane. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Stefan. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Getting near the end. Um, I'm Andy Lane. I'm the director of the Division of Rhinology. I was bringing up the rear, but now I see uh, Charlie Dallas Santina jumped in and gets that honor. So uh, very impressive evening here. So many great labs with opportunities for trainees. Um, most of the rhinology division research was described earlier on. So you heard from Dr. Rowan, Dr. Lajwi, Dr. Ramanathan, Dr. Kim, Dr. London. That's pretty good representation from a division that's not named otology. Uh, we're a team with a very strong basic research culture, which is really unusual for rhinology nationwide. And now I'm happy to say that Nick really bringing in the clinical research uh, online too. So just to keep it brief, um, my basic research lab uh, focus has been in two areas. One is chronic bronchitis with nasal polyps, which is a disease of unknown etiology that severely impacts our patient's quality of life. And it's generally the most difficult form of CRS to control even after surgery. That may be changing somewhat in the era of biologics, but I think in a way that just makes it more interesting scientifically. So we have some more traction into what drives the disease molecularly. Um, my other main interest of research is olfactory loss uh, and specifically how inflammation affects the olfactory system. Oh, uh, next slide, Stefan, thanks. I mean, the general gist of my sinusitis research is that polypoid sinusitis is an inflammatory disease that at its center is a disorder of the epithelial lining, as Stefan was talking about. We use many techniques in cell culture, immunology, microbiology to, uh, to explore how epithelial cells drive and perpetuate chronic eosinophilic inflammation. This includes studying whole tissue samples from patients who are growing epithelial cells differentiated in culture, either at the air liquid interface or in these organoids, 3D organoids. We're uh, interested in the interaction between epithelial cells and other cell types, uh, whether they be mesenchymal cells or immune cells. And my lab also creates transgenic mouse models to, identify, uh, to investigate some of these subcellular pathways in vivo. Um, the other research is about the immune system of the olfactory epithelium and how that impacts the sense of smell. I've been working in this area for many years, and then with COVID, it suddenly blew up and went mainstream. Um, again, we study human tissue biopsies and mouse models to understand inflammatory signaling, particularly as it uh, pertains to regeneration and maintenance of the immune barrier. The olf olfactory system is really interesting because it's the only nervous tissue that has the capacity to regenerate, unlike the inner ear, for example. So by overexpressing cytokines in the olfactory epithelium, uh, and that picture is there uh, expressing TNF alpha. We've demonstrated that inflammation causes olfactory loss, in part because there's a loss of neurons and in part because of failure of regeneration. And um, we've used this research over the years. We had a cell, uh, cell stem cell paper on it recently that uh, got some, got some uh, notice. Um, this mouse gets very severe inflammation and it can recover once the cytokine is turned off. And the inflammation is uh, very severe. It correlates in many ways with what you see in human olfactory tissue and CRS. Uh, including this proliferation of basal stem cells that don't differentiate into new cells. And this kind of uh, runs into the COVID-19 story. We've made interesting observations about ACE2 expression in the olfactory epithelium, uh, the preferential infection of sustentacular cells. We're involved in collaborations with infectious disease and other animal resources do infections uh, in mice and hamsters and study the immune response. 
Um, there's a paper coming out soon that we participated in using uh, extracellular vesicle delivery for a nasal vaccine. That's kind of interesting. There's a lot of opportunities for, for residents and any trainee to get involved in some pretty high level uh, basic science uh, research. Um, the other slide, Safan, please. Um, so basically, I think the, the idea in, in my lab is really, I, I look at it as an opportunity to kind of prepare people for a clinician scientist career. So we have a mentor, mentorship in abundance uh, between all the people you've, uh, we've talked about, uh, we've heard from in our division. Um, we have a lab meeting, and we encourage the participation in that, to getting to critically evaluate the literature, um, and then uh, identify knowledge gaps and plan studies. There's training in grant writing. Uh, previous trainees have written grants and gotten grants funded, including Niall, who had an NIH grant funded while he was a resident. Um, we've had, uh, we encourage the productivity in papers and presentations, and really, you know, I wanted to see people compete successfully in the end for, for fellowship positions and academic positions. And Murray kind of bragged about some of the people we've had, but really, you know, if you look at rhinology as a whole, which I said is not a very big basic science field, we have a huge representation of the NIH funded rhinologists across the country. And people who worked in the lab like Murray and Justin Turner and Mike Ohansky and, and Niall, and also other people who are residents like Bruce Tan or, or Brad Goldstein, who I think this makes up the lion's share of all the NIH grants and basic research in the country. So that's all I was planning to talk about. Um, thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you, Andy. Um, last speaker tonight, Charlie de la Santina. Uh, I do not have your slide. If you don't mind sharing your screen, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll stop my sharing and you can go right ahead. No problem. Um, is my screen on? Yes. Great. Uh, so, hi, I'm Charlie de la Santina. I'm uh, uh, batting cleanup, I guess. <clears throat> uh, my lab's called the uh, Vestibular Neuroengineering Lab. Uh, it's largely a mix of mostly uh, PhD biomedical engineering students and then otolaryngology and neck surgery uh, trainees and uh, sometimes faculty. <clears throat> we really have sort of five themes in the lab. All are around the idea of uh, understanding vestibular anatomy, pathophysiology, and then restoring loss of vestibular function. So some of the projects that uh, uh, trainees have done in the lab sometimes link with other labs, uh, like for instance, Wade Chen or another colleague might have a transgenic mouse. Uh, and uh, we have means of measuring vestibular function in mice. And that's been a productive line of research. Uh, Dan Sun, uh, now on our faculty, has done some nice histology work in rhesus monkeys, uh, looking at the effects of gentamicin and, and uh, vestibular implant surgery. Uh, another branch of work that we do is uh, trying to improve diagnosis of vestibular disorders. Uh, sometimes that involves developing new video oculography methods or new methods of just clinical testing of vestibular reflexes. And so for instance, you can see here, whereas we usually manually move the head for doing head impulse testing and get pretty noisy stimuli and data, uh, we have an automated uh, system that we've developed in the lab uh, and have been testing now. Uh, Desi Shu online has been leading some of that work. We get much, much cleaner data, which helps us to identify who could benefit from some new therapies like the vestibular implant. The, by far the largest uh, aspect of work we do involves developing either technologies for vestibular implant or uh, testing it. Uh, this involves anything from computational modeling, uh, sort of finite, finite element uh, based modeling to engineering electrodes or circuitry, or sometimes working with uh, uh, the Hopkins electrical engineering department to make uh, application specific integrated circuits uh, for these devices. I share a couple of grants, uh, one with Gene Friedman on a new technology for develop, uh, delivering current to the inner ear and elsewhere in the body. Uh, that doesn't require pulses of current, but could deliver DC and could have profound impact on how we stimulate the body, whether it's uh, the brain, the inner ear, or the heart. And I share a grant with Kathy Cullen in biomedical engineering, uh, looking at uh, uh, plasticity in the central nervous system uh, using vestibular reflexes. Most of our work involves either working with rodents, usually chinchillas, uh, sometimes mice, um, or with non-human primates, uh, usually rhesus monkeys, sometimes marmosets. We've got a number of offshoot projects. The type of work we do almost always involves creating a disease model in a rodent, 
and then um, fixing it, uh, destroying vestibular reflexes, say with genomycin, and then restoring them with a vestibular implant, and then going back and doing the same work again in rhesus monkeys. Uh, you can see the sort of outcomes we get here where we can knock out vestibular function, then partially restore it and see improvement over just the first week of use. Um, the main projects happening in the lab right, uh, say over the next four or five years, will be uh, in animals now. We're trying to develop a vestibular implant targeting the utricle and saccule, which sense uh, gravitational acceleration and head translation. Uh, that's following on the line of 15 to 20 years worth of research for developing a vestibular implant that works for the semicircular canals. And for this work, we collaborate with a group at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, uh, which is the same group in California that makes retinal prostheses. Um, the other main branch of work is that the semicircular canal vestibular implant has made it all the way to a clinical trial. Uh, and you can see on screen here, uh, what I'm doing is wiggling the motion sensor of our eight implant recipients vestibular implant um, giving him an artificial sensation of head movement, which is driving his eyes reflexively to follow what he perceives as a head movement. Um, so that's a, a pretty clear demonstration that we can at least partially restore the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, and you can read more about it in a, a paper that we were very excited to get in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last year. Uh, the, the one and only other time anything about bilateral vestibular loss was in the New England Journal was about 70 years ago. Um, so um, baby steps, but uh, we are founding a new field and uh, I would welcome anyone who wants to join it. Uh, the other branch that I didn't talk much about is uh, we've had a nice productive line of research working with Brian Ward, Dan Sun, and uh, soon uh, Yuri Agarwal, looking at epidemiologic uh, aspects of vestibular loss and its impact on individuals and society. Uh, we're going to have to come back and do now a, a retrospective uh, cost utility analysis to, to uh, look at how uh, our vestibular implant outcomes fare in terms of whether or not they're providing a net benefit to society and uh, whether they should be paid for by Medicare and related groups. Um, our lab is uh, remarkably small. Uh, right now I have three graduate students. Uh, I will be recruiting reporting, I'm sorry, recruiting a couple over the next year, but I tend to keep the lab as small as I can uh, to get the work done because I like to work very closely one-on-one -on -one with each of the trainees. Um, Desi Shu, formerly a resident, now uh, um, in our Neurotology Fellowship Program, uh, has been a study coordinator uh, for our vestibular implant trial, also for the first inner ear gene therapy trial led by Novartis. Um, and uh, continues on as a senior member of the team. And I think he'd be a great person to talk to if you want to get a sense of the kind of work we do. Um, that's it. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, you've got my email. I'd be happy to talk with any of you. Thank you, Charlie. Well, that concludes our research fair. I want to thank everybody for participating and showing us your really cool cutting edge research. Uh, and you, everybody has made this really uh, a great experience for me. It's, it's very easy to organize. So I uh, am very grateful for that. Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, Stefan for organizing this year. Um, it's just a tremendous uh, opportunity to see the, the breadth and depth of research uh, in this department and what's available for our trainees. Um, this uh, has mostly been recorded. I'm going to stay on with Stefan and re-record the uh, introduction because I know uh, we want to keep this as a, a, a living document, a uh, living resource uh, that people can go back to. So once we wrap that up, uh, we'll send out uh, a link to everybody uh, so that you can use it to uh, show other trainees. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Okay. Uh, thanks, Stefan. No problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, so if you want, Stefan, uh, just bring up the slides again and, yeah. and you can I'll, run them. I'll, I'll just be quick. I'll bring, uh, I'll start with Zandi's.
Okay, sorry, this is at the end. We didn't start the recording at the beginning, but we want this to be available to you. This is the introduction to our otolaryngology head and neck surgery annual research fair. Uh, I'm John Carey. I'm the T32 uh, director and division of otology um, division chief. Um, let's go through the introductory slides that Zandi put together. Um, our residency research uh, is characterized by two match numbers. So we had four residents who matched in March, 2021. Two of them matched in the traditional five-year training sequence and they have a six months research opportunity and two matched in a six and a half year training sequence in which two years of research is supported by our NIH T32 grant. Um, the process to determine research mentors during the internship year is resident driven. It's overseen by the residency program director, Dr. Hillel, by uh, the T32 directors, Dr. Lauer and myself. This is an essential part of helping people decide what research they're going to do. We also hope to have a research dinner again with the residents and faculty. We want to emphasize that research is part of the training culture here, not just for the T32 residents, but for all the residents. Next. Sorry, Zandi, I'm, I'm stealing your uh, your slides. Do you want to? Okay. Uh, go the go impact, for it, John. I think you're, you're doing a great job. <laughs> the impact of the T32 program uh, is really driven home by the, these data. Pre-1999, before the T32 program, only 20% of graduates of this program took academic faculty positions. Following uh, the inception of the T32, uh, that's been... 74%, and we've consistently stayed, I think, above 60% for that number. So it truly changes the culture of a program to have this, but we do want to emphasize it's not just for the T32 trainees, but for all of our trainees. Uh, next. And then uh, I wanted to discuss briefly our transition from the T32 to R25. Uh, so Stefan will bring up those slides. Um, as you may have heard, NIDCD has decided that all otolaryngology head and neck surgery residency T32s must transition to R25s. So this is for resident research training. Uh, the R25 mechanism uh, was chosen by NIDCD because it offers more flexibility to incorporate, for example, clinical experience during the research time. They've specified 80% research, 20% clinical during the one to two years that are recommended. And it also affords the opportunity to incorporate medical student research positions in the program. Next. Other perks of the R25 mechanism, not just salary support for the residents, but up to $20,000 per year for each resident for coursework, workshops, research supplies, et cetera, and up to $3,000 per year uh, for travel per resident. For the medical students, there's an NRSA level stipend and up to $4,200 per year for travel tuition and training expenses. Next, so our plan currently uh, as we work on this uh, grant is uh, again to have two residents per year in a separate match. Um, we have an option for either an 18 month uh, research block in which case residents would be done in total in six years or 24 months uh, as we do now, again, with 6.5 years, including a super chief rotation. Which of these is being determined uh, partly based on survey feedback with uh, this year's residency applicants, but, but we are looking for feedback from all of you. So please reach out to Amanda and me. Um, we are going to also add two resident, I'm sorry, medical student slots per year for research through a competitive application process with nine months of research uh, plus an externship uh, in our uh, otolaryngology clinical program. Uh, underrepresented minorities, both racial and ethnic, as well as uh, uh, abilities will be actively recruited. Uh, next, I think that's the end of those slides. And then I gave a brief introduction to research in my group. Uh, sorry, Stefan, for all the slide changes. Um, this will be the last one. So uh, my research uh, covers several areas. Uh, I first emphasize uh, uh, biomarkers for vestibular migraine. This is a hugely unmet need, I think, in the community of dizzy patients. Um, it's a very major source of migraine, uh, a very major source of dizziness and vertigo, underappreciated. 
and the physiology is not really understood. We do have growing evidence that inflammatory neuropeptides like CGRP are implicated in migraine headaches. The question is, do they also play a role in vestibular migraine? We've previously found uh, in the uh, lower left panel that uh, salivary CGRP is elevated in patients with vestibular migraine um, in the black bar, just as they are in patients with common migraine. But that assay is difficult because mucins are present in saliva. It's very difficult to separate the peptide components uh, accurately. So we don't think this is a, uh, necessarily a good long-term uh, single patient test. So we're looking now at plasma and serum. Uh, these are studies underway with help from Mariana Braid and the prote proteomics core. And we're also exploring uh, immunohistochemistry uh, for inflammatory peptides in the trigeminal nerve endings. For example, the salivary gland is uh, a relatively easy target given uh, the number of salivary gland biopsies that are done for Sjogren's syndrome. And we're working with Lisa Ruper to explore that as a potential avenue. Next, I do a lot of work uh, both clinically and research-wise on superior canal dehiscence syndrome. Um, we're gaining increasing experience with uh, plugging the superior canal on both sides for patients who have bilateral uh, SCDS. And we want to know the physiologic effects of that. Um, so I'm pleased to be starting a new collaboration with Kathy Cullen uh, with patients wearing uh, wearable inertial sensors to follow their posture, gait, and also uh, measuring eye movements in the real world before and after surgery to see uh, what the effect of this lesion is and how does surgery change the, those par parameters. We're interested in determining the true prevalence of this. A number of studies have suggested uh, it's highly prevalent on CT scan, but that may be an incidental or even false positive finding. We wanna bring patients in for audio vestibular testing to really characterize um, uh, a prospectively a group of patients who are found to have this on CT scan and see what's the true population prevalence. And finally, uh, we're always building and maintaining our, our database for future studies. Uh, my final slide, um, my current student, Pavan Krishnan, whose uh, contact is there, has an interest in information uh, technology and informatics, and, and I'm mentoring him in developing some cloud-based automated workflow solutions for head and neck tumor board uh, and patient dashbo dashboards for their cancer navigators, and in generally incorporating more of the Office 365 platforms for clinical and research processes for example, apps for patients to report uh, daily symptoms for research. Okay, thank you. Sorry this is at the end, but hope you made it this far and uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the research fair. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, okay. Stefan.